All right, good morning. morning. Great to see you all this morning. It's so great to be together for our worship time. I know we're a small group this morning, I think a little extra small. Actually, uh, the previous Sundays kind of went up every Sunday, but I think today probably regression. Still have a number of folks who are unable to worship with us during this time. But also we have vacation season, so uh, people are taking vacations, and we have several in that category uh, today. But it's uh, great to be together for those who can uh, join us this morning and worship together, and I look forward to that. And as always, we're continuing to welcome those who are in our church family who are watching online and other friends and guests. Uh, That part of it continues to amaze me. I hear stories every week of people who are sharing on Facebook uh, our service. And uh, I had found out last week I had some relatives all the way out in Arizona who watched last week. So it's just amazing how the Lord's using this to get his word out to people. And uh, so we're very thankful for that. Uh, one of those on vacation this week is Phil Powell and his family. So Phil is our worship leader, of course. So we're not going to have worship this morning. No, I'm just kidding. Very thankful Jason is going to lead this morning and uh, appreciate him doing that. We are continuing to operate with a limited worship team for now. Uh, there's the need for physical distancing. Probably after Phil gets back from vacation, we'll reconfigure some things and maybe figure out a way to expand that. Uh, but we continue to be limited uh, for this time uh, time being. I do want to thank you for how you have uh, observed our, the reopening guidelines. I know that this is different, and I know that this is not what any of us want to do, but I just want to thank you this morning for your response to uh, the guidelines that we have in place and your respect toward those things and uh, cooperation, and just uh, thank you so much. I also want to just say thanks this morning to our church family for being so faithful in giving. You know, a lot of times in situations like this, people can get disconnected, and certainly a lot of that taking place in the context of churches in our area and certainly throughout our nation. And a lot of times that what goes along with that is people uh, may regress in their faithfulness to give to the Lord. Uh, this church has been completely opposite of that. And so I'm just very thankful uh, for your commitment to con- continue to worship the Lord so faithfully uh, in that way. And I just want you to know what a great encouragement that is to me as your pastor and our board of elders. And uh, And I know it's You're not just giving to the church, you're giving to the Lord as an act of worship. So thank you for that. I'm going to read just a brief scripture this morning, and we're going to pray together and then begin our praise and worship. In Psalm 136, you can just listen as I read, the psalmist declared, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. O give thanks to the Lord of Lords, for his mercy endures forever. As we reflect on that just briefly this morning, that tells us that we should make this time all about him. You know, we've gathered here this morning, all of us with concerns and distractions and certainly concerns about what's going on in our world and certainly in our culture. But that reminds us of the goodness of our God and his sovereignty in spite of all that's going on this morning. And so I want us to make this time all about him, to lay aside these things that are concerning us and and even our opinions about all of those things and simply make this time all about him. Uh, This is a time to worship him, to give him thanks for his goodness, to give him thanks for his mercy, to exalt him. He is the eternal creator God, the one who is above all things, the sovereign ruler of this universe, who is in absolute control in spite of the chaos of our world. So let's give our full attention to him this morning. We're going to pray, and then we're going to be able to exalt his name through praise and worship. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much this morning for the gathering, for the assembly, uh, this church family. Thank you that we can gather for the purpose to exalt you to remember your goodness, to remember your mercy, to remember that you are sovereign, 
and to exalt your name, to exalt you as the God of gods, to exalt you of the Lord of lords. You are the one and only true God, and you have proven to be that. And you demonstrated the greatness of your love and mercy for us in that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, God the Son, God in human flesh, out of your great desire to redeem us, to save us, to reconcile us to you in a relationship that will last forever. So thank you. Thank you for the greatness of your mercy, the greatness of your goodness. Thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are complete. We've been made whole. We are victorious. Our world's in a mess. You're quite aware of that. Yet you're in control. And in you, we are completely safe and secure. And we're victorious. And so I pray this morning that we will be able to lay aside all of our concerns, all of our distractions, even, even attitudes that may not be pleasing to you and to give you the worship and praise that you so much deserve. I pray for Jason as he leads us this morning, that your Holy Spirit will, uh, will work through him to lead us in great praise and, and expression of worship to you through songs and through music this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Aren't you glad that uh, God's not surprised by anything that shows up on the news, in the newspaper? On the TV, I know I am. You know, there's a lot of uh, pretty much all the news now centers around hate, right? Everybody, has somebody hating on somebody for something, and we've got the answer, don't we? God ultimately has the answer. It's just love. It's that simple, and uh, it doesn't need to be complicated. It's not meant to be complicated. If it was, I wouldn't understand it. So. Let's sing together. Let's sing loud. If you're at home, sing. Sing with us, okay? So your neighbors wonder what's going on in your house, all right?
Amen. Shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our beautiful Father. We shall. sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore amen Straight.
Lord God, as we watch the news and we look at the newspapers and, and, and emails and everything, Lord, we see a lot of hate in the world, a lot of people hating people just to hate. And we, we have the answer, Lord. You do. It's just love, simple love. I just pray, Lord, that uh, you'd protect those that protect us here. And uh, I just pray for uh, each one in this room and everyone watching at home, Lord, that you keep them safe. And I uh, just pray, Lord, that we could each be the light that this world desperately needs. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jason and Emily and Kaylin and Susan, sound personnel this morning. Thank you all so much. A great time of worship together. Uh, great to be together and to worship in that way. It's great to have my father-in-law in the front row this morning. I have him right where I want him. In the front row. Talk about pressure having your father in law in the front row. Actually, it's not pressure. I told him if I get tired this morning, I'll just call a timeout and let him come and take over. The Apostle Peter declared in Acts chapter 10, he said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Those are the words of Peter as he brought the gospel to a man by the name of Cornelius a Roman centurion, a Gentile, a Jewish man bringing a Gentile the gospel. And so in that, in essence, he said that God is not a respecter of people. In other words, God doesn't play favorites. Unfortunately, Christians and churches sometimes do. And that can be demonstrated in a number of different ways. You know, in our culture in particular, now some churches, particularly more contemporary models, will market their church to a particular category of people. You know, whether it be millennials or Generation X or whatever it may be. That's a form of partiality, favoritism. Sometimes churches want their church to consist of people with only a certain skin color. Sometimes churches will demonstrate partiality toward people who have wealth or may have a position of prestige and power in society. You know, sometimes churches will unfortunately give leadership positions to people in the context of the church on the basis of them having some money or position or status in society. That's unfortunate. God doesn't play favorites. The Apostle James declared, the Lord through James declared, that Christians and churches are not to play favorites in any arena of life, including the assembly, the gathering, the body of Christ. James is going to declare, we're going to see him declare this morning that this is a rather serious offense. To demonstrate favoritism or partiality within the family of God. In fact, we're going to see James really, really thunder loudly against that. And I want you to know this morning, I'm going to join him in his thunder. And I hope you'll join me in that thunder as well. We'll take a look at this in James chapter 2. If you'll find your way there, please. James chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 as we continue our series of studies in James. We're calling it the series Living Triumphantly in Trials because everything that James addresses in his letter to these first century believers was in the context of trials, including what we're going to discuss this morning. Now, it's very interesting that we came to this passage of Scripture today. I want you to know it's not planned. It's not planned on the basis of what's happening in our culture, on the basis of what's happening in our nation. You know me, I teach systematically through books of the Bible, and this is just where we happen to land this morning. I think it's very timely. Uh, it wasn't planned that way, and, and so I'm not planned, I haven't planned this to address all kinds of current events that are going on in our culture but we'll certainly take the opportunity to address some of those things and really what our mindset should be as a believer. So the whole context of this, it really takes us back to chapter 1, 
trials, number one, but then also James has been talking about practicing the word, beginning in verse 22. Uh, he said, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Uh, so far, he's given us several significant reasons. Number one, to avoid self-deception. Uh, number two, to enjoy the freedom of obedience, the freedom that comes in, obe in obeying uh, the perfect law of liberty. And number three, to prove the reality that we have been brought forth by the word of truth that we have been given life and salvation through the word of truth concerning God's glorious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So James has been talking about being doers of the word. Practice the word. And in fact, he continues that focus as we move to chapter 2. The focus here is practicing the word by not playing favorites in the assembly. Why did James address this? Because it was happening. Uh, because it was happening in the context of the body of Christ. And again, it was happening in the context of trials, the testing of faith, and persecution. And, and I'll help us to understand that here in just a little while, primarily through the example that James will give in verses 2 through 4. So James, is he, he's talking this morning about practicing the word, not playing favorites. Let's just simply begin with his address this morning. Number one, verse one, he said, my brethren. So who's he addressing? Believers, right? He's addressing the family of God. He is reminding these people in this first century world of their family responsibility, of their family identity, that they were members of the family of God. And he is giving them that strategic reminder in this address because he's about to give them a very pointed instruction. Notice with me the instruction, verse 1. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. That word, partiality, means to judge by the front of something. Uh, in other words, to judge by the appearance of something. It means to show favoritism, partiality, toward another based on appearance. You know, whether the appearance has something to do with skin color or wealth or prestige or power or position. James said, don't show partiality. Don't show favoritism. And he gave this instruction for a reason, because it was happening. And in the context in which James is writing, he's writing to believers, but he's also writing primarily to Jewish believers who have been scattered by persecution in this first century world. And sometimes in this culture, in the world in which James is addressing, wealthy Jewish people would often covet or compete for recognition and honor. And so in that context, as James is writing to Jewish Christians who are suffering, and we're going to see this in his example in verses 2 through 4, it's very possible that some of these believers were catering to the rich, to the wealthy, to a particular category of people in order to try and relieve their suffering, their persecution. And so in that context, as James gave this instruction, no partiality, he gave four reasons. We're going to note those reasons. Number one, playing favorites is inconsistent with faith in Christ. Totally inconsistent. Doesn't look like Jesus Christ. Again, verse one, James said, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Who is the center of attention here? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? I love the emphasis that James gave here on Jesus and being the center of all of this. The translation could literally read, the Lord Jesus Christ of glory. He is emphasizing the greatness of Christ. He is emphasizing the glory of Christ. And by the way, the glorious one, who was willing as God the Son for a period of time to lay aside the fullness of his glory, meaning his rights and privileges as the eternal Son of God, and to take on human flesh. 
and to come into this world and become obedient to death, even the death of the cross, in order to make the payment for sin, not for a select few, but for the entire world, for all of mankind. And so James is emphasizing here the greatness and the glory of Christ, and he gave the instruction, don't, don't hold faith in him with partiality. In other words, don't profess faith with partiality. Don't practice faith with partiality in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because favoritism, partiality, is absolutely contrary to the nature of Jesus Christ, the one who laid aside his glory to die for all and to make it possible for all humanity who would believe in him and what he accomplished through his death, burial, and resurrection to be reconciled to a holy God. And so James said, don't hold faith in him with partiality. It is contrary to his nature. You see, when you practice the faith with partiality, you're acting absolutely inconsistent with what Jesus Christ, God the Son, modeled during his earthly life and his public life and ministry. He demonstrated no partiality at all. He ministered to the poor and needy and how he did that so much throughout the Gospels. But not to the exclusion of others. He also ministered to the wealthy. People like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, Zacchaeus, that rich tax collector, and Jesus Christ is the one, God the Son, prior to his ascension and his return to his glory, made it clear that people who know him and have a relationship with him are to take the good news about him to all nations, to all ethnos, to people with different languages, to people all around the world. He made it clear that his people and his church were to be witnesses to the world not just to a select few. And so the point is this, any form of favoritism, discrimination, partiality in the assembly is not like Jesus. It doesn't look like the Lord of glory at all. In fact, it dishonors him. In fact, it grieves him. And it's also harmful, by the way. It hurts people. People are hurt when favoritism and partiality in any form is demonstrated in the body of Christ. And sometimes it turns people off from Christianity. In fact, I read the story of Mahatma Gandhi, the Hindu leader of India, well recognized in his autobiography, who wrote that during his student days... He was reading the gospel seriously, in fact, considering becoming a Christian, as he believed the teachings of Jesus might be the answer to the caste system in India, you know, racism, believed the teachings of Jesus might be the solution to that. And so on a Sunday, he decided to attend a service, a church service, and talk to the pastor about becoming a Christian. As he came to the church and got ready to enter the sanctuary, the usher refused to give him a seat and said, you just need to go worship with your own people. And so Gandhi left the church, and he never returned. And he said, if Christians have caste differences, then I might as well remain a Hindu. See, it can, be, it can cause great harm. It can turn people away from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because it doesn't look like him. So let's listen very carefully to this instruction. Do not hold faith in the Lord Jesus Christ with partiality in any form because it's inconsistent. It doesn't look like him. Reason number two Playing favorites is actually an act, listen carefully, of evil. It's an expression of evil. James says in verse 2, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, 
And you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place. And then you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So here's the scene. It's the assembly, the gathering, the family of God, Christians gathering in Christ's name, two categories of people who come into the assembly, a rich man, poor man. And so here James has given us a hypothetical scene. He's giving us a hypothetical scene because this is something that was probably happening. In fact, it may have been something that James himself had even witnessed and that he had seen. And so he gives us the description of two people who come into the assembly to point him out how evil favoritism, partiality can be. That the, first of all, the rich man with gold rings. The translation could literally me, read, he was gold-fingered. In other words, he had gold hanging all over him. And also fine apparel. We're talking about bright flashy clothing. In other words, this person comes into the assembly putting his wealth on full display. But then you have the poor man who comes in in his filthy clothing, his work clothing, his only clothing. You know, in the first century world, in the context in which Jesus mentored, the average common person was poor. Most of them would have only had the clothing on their back. And so here we see two different kinds of people and also two different responses. The response to the rich man, the usher pays attention to him. You know, the word in the original language literally means to gaze upon. He was fixated on the appearance of this wealthy man. And he says to him, you sit here in a good place. That seems to imply, you know, take him to a seat. The best seat in the house, you know, maybe even to the front row. And I'm not saying this about the people in our front row this morning, but in Jewish culture, in Jewish culture, a wealthy Jewish leader like a, a scribe or a Pharisee w would have loved that. Th that's what they desired. Uh, that's what they often sought. But then notice with me the response to the poor man. The implication here is he hardly pays attention to him. He says, you stand there. Now, you stand over there. You, you point to the place. You know, stand, no seat. Or if you want to sit, you can sit at my footstool. In other words, you can sit on the floor beside me, beside the usher. And that had a way of exalting the person who was sitting in the chair. And so we see partiality taking place in the family of God. Now, notice with me James' question again in verse 4. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's a rhetorical question. It anticipates the answer. What's the answer? The answer is yes, of course. That's what's happened. They have shown partiality, favoritism toward the rich man, discrimination toward the poor man, and all of this is happening in the assembly. The church, the body of Christ. And James says, you have become judges, judges by appearance. You have judged, you have taken it upon yourself to judge and declare that one person is more valuable than another. But he didn't say you just become judges. He said you become judges with evil thoughts, evil motives. You know, what were the motives? Possibly self-gain, future favor. Or from an assembly standpoint, you know, you take the rich man to the front and you give him the best seat. That may mean more money in the offering plate, you know, for the church. Or maybe, and again, we're, we're talking about the context of persecution and trials, maybe with the goal that this rich man will talk to his rich friends, who many of them were persecuting the church, and maybe that will help relieve the pressure of persecution. Regardless of the motive, regardless of the reason, the, this situation is declaring to us that this is totally unlike Christ. And it is a reflection of evil. 
You know, Paul declared that also to Peter. You know, the very Peter that took the gospel to Cornelius, later he played the hypocrite. You know, rec recorded for us in Galatians chapter 2 in a place called Antioch where there were Jewish and Gentile believers worshiping together. And Peter was having a great time doing that and doing that very faithfully as he knew that God intended the gospel to be for the Gentiles also. And he was doing that. He was eating with them until some of the Jewish folks came up from Jerusalem to check it all out. And Peter became fearful that they might ha have uh, thoughts toward him that he didn't want them to have. And so he withdrew from eating with those Gentiles. And Paul came along. And Paul said, I withstood him because Peter was showing favoritism by withstanding him or Paul said I withstood him Paul was declaring I'm letting Peter know that he was acting inconsistent with the Lord Jesus Christ and he was not being controlled by evil or by God he was being controlled by evil by the way Peter's actions even Paul's Barnabas the son of encouragement to be carried away with his hypocrisy. You know, the evil of partiality, discrimination, favoritism, it exists in our world, we certainly know that, but unfortunately, it often exists even in the context of the church. I'm not talking about this church, but I'm talking about the church in general, in many different ways. Of course, the one that we would probably think most about today would be in regard to skin color. I can't tell you how many examples I know about that, but I'll give you a few without naming names. In another state, I know of a church that once turned a child away from an Easter service, an Easter play, simply because of skin color. Disgraceful. Earlier in my Christian life, I once had to confront a pastor in another state because of the use, I became aware of the use of derogatory language. Disgraceful. When I was in seminary, I knew a number of guys who were attempting to go to seminary and pastor churches, in some cases part-time, some cases full-time, out in eastern North Carolina, those little churches I like to call family chapels, you know, they're controlled by a few. But they would go into those situations and they would try to minister across culture. And a lot of them really got into hot water. Some of them were fired. Some of them were hated. Some of them even received death threats as a result of that. Here's what I think about that. Here's what I think about that kind of thinking. I call that kind of thinking, stinking thinking. And I hope you will as well. So here's the bottom line. When it comes to that issue, that issue alone, and there are many, many forms of partiality, but since we're on that subject this morning, without going into great detail, let me make it clear to the body of Christ at Botetourt Community Church, in the sight of God, according to his word, there is one race. Only one, the human race, the race of Adam, who has been created in the image of God, in his likeness, meaning he's given us intellect, emotion, and will. He's created us in his image, and he has given us the ability, the capacity to know him and to have a relationship with him. And that is not divided into races. There is one race the human race. And of course, in God's infinite wisdom, without going into great detail this morning, he allowed for different color of skin, but that has nothing to do with race. There's one race, the human race. And listen, if we could take that message to the streets today, you know, really might make a difference because, because the issue with what we see going on in our culture, the issue is truth. What's true? Man has created this idea of race to divide and to harm and to hurt. And at the top of the list in playing that game is a whole lot of politicians 
who throw fuel on the fire. But in the sight of God, there is one race. And so the bottom line for us this morning is we should never, ever engage in any kind of favoritism, partiality, discrimination in any way, whether it has to do with wealth, whether it has to do with color, whether it has to do with prestige and power or anything else. Because once we engage in that, just like Peter up in Antioch, we are engaged in an act of evil. And we're not reflecting the nature of our God. And he isn't pleased. A third reason we shouldn't play favorites in the assembly or any other arena. I just said it, but now we're going to talk about it a little bit more. It's contrary to the nature of God. It's inconsistent with faith in Christ. It's an expression of evil. It's contrary to God's nature. Verse 5, James said, listen, my beloved brethren. Now look, he's saying, listen carefully, listen with understanding, and I like the fact that he calls them my beloved brethren. These are people he are, he's addressing with an issue, but he's reminding them of his love. These are people that he loved. He loved them enough to tell them the truth. You know, his love is rising up to meet the righteous anger that he felt about this situation, the discrimination that he just described in verses 2 through 4. So he said, listen, my beloved brother, notice his question, verse 5. He's pointing back, by the way, to verses 2 through 4 in the example that he just gave. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. And so he's talking about the poor of this world. We're talking about people who had honest poverty, prevalent in the first century world. Again, people who live day to day for their daily bread. And so James is asking the question, the answer is yes, God did choose the poor, but when God chooses, it's not discrimination. Hey, we're not talking about choosing to the exclusion of others. God chose the poor to be rich in faith. We're not talking about just the substance of salvation. We're, what James is communicating here is that God chose the poor to be rich in faith, knowing that the, the poor had nothing to depend upon in this world. You know, no material resources. And so those who had nothing in this world, he chose them knowing that they could be rich in faith and that they would be heirs and members of his kingdom. They had nothing in this world. But, they gave, but God gave them a promise. Rich in faith, heirs of his kingdom to those who believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Jesus modeled this throughout his public life and ministry. He ministered to the poor and the helpless. Luke chapter 6, we're told, Then he lifted up his eyes to his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God the poor who believed in him as Savior. But again, this is not discrimination because it was not to the exclusion of others. He ministered to people from all backgrounds. He ministered to people who were wealthy and rich. He died for all of humanity. James is simply making the, po the point here that God had a heart for the poor as he did for the entire world, and those who knew him and had a relationship with him through the Lord Jesus could be rich in faith, they could be heirs of his kingdom, and listen, there are many in the kingdom of God in that category. So James is making that point about God's love for the poor. Then he has in verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. That's a contrast. God loves and honors the poor who believe in him through his son, the Lord Jesus. He makes them heirs of his kingdom. He gives them the ability, the, the capacity to be rich in faith. And yet here we have Christians in the first century world who were dishonoring them. God honors, Christians were dishonoring the poor. James said, you have dishonored the poor man. You have disrespected him. You have discriminated against him. You have said, stand there or sit here on the floor. 
you know, I don't know about you, but I can feel James' emotion here. You know, you can sense his temperature gauge going up with righteous anger, and rightfully so. Notice with me his next question, verse 6. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Rhetorical question, the answer is yes, and that's what was happening in this world. And that's what made this situation so ridiculous. Many who were in the category of wealth were oppressing the poor. That's a general statement about what some rich were doing. In some cases, that was part of the persecution, the trials that, were, that believers were facing. We'll see that in verse 7. But they were also oppressing in other ways. In chapter 5, uh, James is going to talk about the rich people having to howl because they were going to have to face judgment in how they were taking advantage of common laborers in that day and withholding wages. And, and again, as James just mentioned in verse 5, in some cases, believers are being drugged into the courts by the wealthy. Uh, different kinds of courts. Jewish religious courts often controlled by wealthy religious leaders. Part of the persecution that these believers were facing, just read Acts chapter 4. You get a picture of that. But then there were also the Roman civil courts where the rich always had advantage. And so in both cases, believers, people within the context of Christianity, were being drugged into the courts by those of wealth to gain an advantage and to oppress believers. And in some cases, persecute them. In fact, that's what his next question is about in verse 7. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are call, called? Again, a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. They were. Many were blaspheming the noble name. The noble name, we're talking about the name of the king, the Lord Jesus Christ. The name by which these believers had been called and given salvation, a relationship with God. Many that, to whom they were catering were blaspheming his name. That means speaking against the name of Christ, hating him, persecuting his church. And so James is making an argument here. It's an argument that we should understand. In verses 5 through 7, why are you disre disrespecting the poor for whom Jesus died, who are heirs of the kingdom? And why are you catering to the rich who in general were mistreating Christians and blaspheming the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, again, one of the main answers, one of the main reasons this was happening more than likely is that some in the believing community were catering in this way to try to relieve the pressure of persecution. You know, taking us back to chapter 1. To make life easier. So what we have here, we have Christians playing favorites, the rich over the poor, God not playing favorites. He loves the poor. Uh, he loves the poor who can be rich in faith and we're heirs of his kingdom. So Christians playing favorites. Again, Paul in Galatians chapter 2, as he spoke about this, said, but from those who seem to be something, He's talking about wealthy Jewish religious leaders. Whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. Because God shows personal favoritism to no man. None. In Proverbs chapter 24, we're told it is good to show, not show partiality in judgment. Why is it good? Because God doesn't. That's his character. That's his nature. You see, when believers, the church, in any regard, show favoritism, discrimination in the assembly, in any capacity, they are acting unlike God. And that's displeasing to him. A subtle form of this, and this would maybe be more relevant to a church like ours that I know wouldn't openly do this in any regard, 
I'm speaking confidently in you because I know that. I believe that. But here is a subtle form that could affect a body like this, you know, a small body of believers. A subtle form of favoritism could be cliques. You know what I mean by that, cliques? I'm all for groups. I like people experiencing community together in the context of groups, but groups are not designed to be exclusive or cliquish in any regard. And so even in a church like ours, that's something that we should guard against and be alert to because it's something God would not like. It's something that would be displeasing to him because it's unlike his character. It's unlike his nature. Reason number four, very quickly this morning, a fourth reason not to play favorites in the assembly. It is a violation of God's law. James, of course it's a violation of God's law, right? If it's contrary to his nature, it's a violation of his law. James is spending a lot of time on this. Have you noticed that? James is not really a very long letter, but he's giving 13 verses to this. And so he is really trying to drive this point home with these believers who were, in some cases, practicing discrimination. And so he makes that final point, listen very carefully, it is a violation of God's law. He adds in verse 8, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. So I like the way James brings into the discussion here the royal law. He's talking to believers. He's emphasizing to believers their membership in the kingdom. The Lord Jesus of glory earlier, the name, the noble name by which they had been called, the name of Christ, uh, the royal law, the law of the king that's to govern the believer's life. James is making it clear here, the way to fulfill that royal law, the king's law, is to love God supremely. That's the first command. And then here, as James noted, love your neighbor as yourself. That goes all the way back to the Old Testament scriptures, Leviticus 19, verse 18, affirmed by Jesus on numerous occasions during his public teaching. In other words, fulfill the royal law by not playing favorites. Not playing favorites, not discriminating, not showing partiality. James says if you do that, you do well. You're doing well. You're being a doer of the word. You're being a doer of the law. Your life is pleasing to God, and you are reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ, the noble name by which you are called. But then he adds in verse 9, but if you show partiality, favoritism, discrimination, you commit sin, and you are convicted by the law as transgressors. In other words, you violate this, you demonstrate favoritism in any regard, you're sinning. You're missing God's mark. You're acting contrary to him and his word. And he said, when you do that, I want you to know this, you're convicted. You are convicted as transgressors. That means you are guilty, you are a lawbreaker, you are a violator of God's royal law. He drives that point home, verses 10 through 11. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Why did James go through all of that in this situation? He's trying to make a point. He's trying to help these believers to understand the importance of, and the seriousness of what he's talking about. To not downplay the seriousness of showing favoritism in the assembly. He is making it clear, if you stumble in that point, and you do this, you are guilty as a lawbreaker of the very law of God. Notice with me his concluding challenge, verse 12. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, and mercy triumphs over judgment. 
So now he comes back once again to the law of liberty. Second time he's used that phrase, going back to chapter 1 the first time, where he referred to it as the perfect law of liberty. The law that frees when obeyed. His point in verses 12 through 13, the person who obeys the law of God experiences freedom. The person who obeys the law of God loves his neighbor as himself everyone, doesn't demonstrate partiality. They experience freedom. But the person who disobeys and takes it upon themselves to judge by the front or the appearance of something disobeys, and that person will have to experience judgment in the sense of answering to the law of God. That person is convicted as a lawbreaker. That was established in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 15, where the Lord said, You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor. Listen, you shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. In other words, Everything that we do is based upon righteousness and truth, meaning that we are going to treat and judge all the same way, just as God would. So this is our call. Going back to verse 8, do well. You will do well. That's our call. Do well. That means no partiality, no favoritism, no discrimination in the assembly. That means loving our neighbor as ourself. And who is a neighbor? Anyone that God places in our path. That's what Jesus taught in his example of the Good Samaritan. You know, Samaritan, Jewish person. Jesus made it clear that our neighbor is anyone that he places that comes into our path. And so James says, you will do well. That's our calling. And so this is what do well means. That means no partiality. That means we obey the royal law. That means we obey the law of liberty. That means as a believer, we have the commitment to obey the king. James has made it clear. Christians are not to play favorites in the assembly, in any arena of life. Four reasons. Number one, it is inconsistent with faith in Christ. Number two, it is an act of evil. Number three, it is contrary to the nature of God. Number three, it is a violation of God's law. I think we have it, right? Two quick summary challenges. Number one, let's always be the kind of believer and church that reflects the character of Christ. And here's what that means, very simply. That means no partiality, no favoritism, no cliques, never discrimination. That means putting on the character of Christ, you know, his life in control. That means obedience to his word, his law, the king's law. A second thought, let's be the kind of church and believer that values every person God sends our way. Every person, regardless of wealth or lack thereof, regardless of position or status in the world, regardless of color, is one race the one that God established, the race of Adam. And you see, in doing that, we will be a great testimony. We'll be a great testimony to the world around us, to a broken world, to a very broken culture, by the way, easy to see, but we can be a witness simply with this. I want you to know I'm so grateful. I'm not sharing this message. We came to it this morning. I'm not sharing this message because this is a problem. It's not. I am so grateful that Botetite Community Church has always been a loving and welcoming church. We have been that. I'm so grateful for that. 
but I'll just say this this morning. Let's honor our Lord, the noble name by which we have been called, the King, and let's make sure that we always keep it that way. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you so much, Father, for your word this morning. It's an amazing word that you gave to your church living in a struggling first century world, uh, facing many issues like we're facing today. And you've made it very clear through James and your inerrant and your inspired word that your people are to reflect you and how you view people and how we should respond to every human being. And with you, there is no favoritism, and that's what you desire and expect of us. And thank you as we reflect that, we'll help to, and we'll please you, number one, then we'll help to enrich this body, and we'll be a great testimony to our world. We invite you to use us in that way, I pray, and thank you that we can be used by you in that way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you this morning. It's been great to be with you. I've enjoyed our time of worship together. Hope you've been encouraged. Hope you've received some fuel for life as we go and leave this place to go do life. May we reflect everything that we've talked about this morning. I'll be available.